Bonjour. Welcome to a new episode of So French, a podcast about the twists and turns, intrigues and insights to all things French. Every two weeks, we select the best, most interesting and fascinating of French news stories, all brought to you from our studio in the heart of Paris. My name is Stefan de Vries. And my name is Sana Wettelsson. And this week, the current war in the Middle East did not start with ISIS, but it sort of began already exactly a century ago this month. We talked to historian James Barr to learn more about France's and Britain's role in the many conflicts in the Middle East. We'll also tell you about a party for French residents only. And we're starting a new segment about Brexit. The next couple of episodes, So French will ask the question, will the UK leave or stay in the EU? And of course, Maud Decan is here to bring you a fresh French word of the day. But first, the most important news story in this week in France. Burning tires, cars queuing for hours to fill up at the gas station, nuclear power plants on strike and protests in the streets. Business as usual in France, you might think. But to be honest, this last week's protests have been the most aggressive the country has seen in many, many years. Protests, of course, uh, against the government's plans to change the country's labor laws. Unions this week did their best to put France to a literal standstill, uh, with the country's refineries being blocked by angry workers and thousands of gas stations therefore running dry. Uh, Stefan, this um, mobilization uh, has been compared by many to the ones against the youth work contract, the CPE, uh, back in 2006. Yeah, exactly. And uh, in, at that time, it was also um, uh, a bill to, well, tackle unemployment because unemployment is still very high in France. And the CPE was actually meant to uh, make it easier for young people to get a job but also make it easier to fire them. And of course, that's something the French don't like. And that's also basically the issue with this new bill. Uh, it makes hiring easier, but also firing. And that's, of course, very liberal. And liberal is still a very dirty word in France. Well, after the, the bill was first proposed by the government, without actually having had any negotiations with either the unions or the employers' uh, organizations, <clears throat> uh, this bill was renegotiated by the government. Um, and it actually got the major union, uh, the uh, reformist union, yeah, the, on its the, side. The more moderate ones. Exactly. But once it got into parliament, it was stop. It didn't gain enough support, and the government decided to push through this bill with by decree, actually, without a vote in parliament. And this is, of course, not a popular vote, and that's why we're now seeing these uh, these protests, who are led by CGT, which is the far left, yeah. uh, far left communist of, sort of very yeah. socialist communist slash communist um, union here in France. Um, what, what, th this is a standoff now because the government says we're not going to give in and CGT says and we're going to continue this until this bo bill is withdrawn. So what do you think is going to happen next? It's a very difficult position for François Hollande because on the one hand he said, well, uh, this bill, uh, there's no, no way that I'm going to back down for blackmail. And on the other hand, this country is in serious trouble um, because the European football championship is beginning in two weeks. Uh, holidays are coming up and it's becoming more and more difficult for people to travel around. We see the images of, of cars burning, uh, heavy, um, very serious confrontations between protesters and the police. Once again, it gives a very bad image uh, of France. Um, if François Hollande decides to cancel the law, well, then he, he comes off as a very weak person. And there's another issue that is that he promised to bring down unemployment. And it looks like everybody forgot that this law is actually uh, meant to bring down unemployment. And um, he said, well, in my uh, term, I will bring down unemployment. And if not, I will not be a candidate. So if he backs down on this law, he can't be a candidate anymore because he shows that he doesn't do anything about unemployment. So it's a catch-22, a very difficult situation for François Hollande and, of course, a very bad situation for, for the country as well. But we should remember that actually this, these protests have quite large support from the public. There have been different, uh, we read about quite a few different uh, uh, polls lately who show that 
up to 65% of French support this pro these protests. Uh, yeah, I was pretty surprised when I saw these numbers. Um, uh, but it's it's sort of a tradition in France to support the people who are on strike. The strange thing is that a lot of people support this bill as well. I think also the majority of the French, because a lot of the French, they know this country has to reform. And they also know that unemployment, which is still above 10%, one of the highest in Europe, um, is, is, is really a serious issue. And so they agree that they, that something has to be done about it, but apparently they don't agree with the propositions the government is doing. I so, think we heard about this. We heard this this story before. <laughs> yeah, I think we can talk many years about the, about the, the problems on the on the on the French labor market. But of course, it's a very serious issue. And in eleven months from now, the presidential election will take place, and it's it's looking now that François Hollande probably will join the huge army of unemployed people in France. <laughs> And it's time now for our So French Word of the Week. And we welcome Maud Descamps. Bonjour, Maud. Bonjour, Stéphane. What's the word you've chosen for us this week? Uh, yes, well, the, the French word of the week is the word intermittent. Actually, it's the same word in English, intermittent. Um, it is a, a special status the artists get in France. It allows them to perceive an allowance from the, the, from the French state uh, when they are not working. It's like an unemployment benefit. And this very special and unique regime was actually created in 1936 by the the SFEO, which is the ancestors of the French Socialist Party. Um, at the very beginning, it was the uh, cinema producers who encouraged the, the creation of this uh, special um, regime uh, because they couldn't find any technicians to work with because these technicians preferred to work with one and only one employer. So how does it work precisely? Well, it's very complex. So I'll just explain the broad lines. The status of uh, intermittent allows you to perceive an unemployment benefit if you have worked a certain amount of hours in uh, the year. They need, uh, for instance, to work 507 hours in a 10 months period to pretend uh, to this um, allowance. So basically, this a status protects the artist from insecurity. But it's not that easy because we know that only two thirds of the French artists can perceive this allowance. And one of the reasons is that the uh, accounting of working hours is a bit blurry. For instance, uh, the rehearsal hours are not included uh, in the count. So you could rehearse for hours and still not get enough hours uh, to perceive the uh, intermittent allowance. Well, that was a really French word, intermittent. Thank you very much, Maud, and see you next time. And from France, we're traveling to the Middle East now. It's exactly a century ago that France and Britain made a secret deal. In the middle of the First World War, the two allies agreed to divide the Middle East between them. It was negotiated by the French diplomat François-Georges Picot and the British politician Sir Mark Sykes. The deal was signed on May 16, 1916 and became known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement. To this day, many people consider that agreement as one cause of the many conflicts in the Middle East. And to talk about this forgotten episode in French and British history, we invited James Barr. He's a historian and the author of the fascinating book A Line in the Sand. And he joins us now from London by Skype. Welcome, Mr. Barr. Hello. Now, these two men, Sykes and Pico, who were they? To me, they seem to be a quintessential British and quintessential French. Is that correct? Sykes and Pico were about as different as you can imagine. Mark Sykes was a Conservative Member of Parliament. He'd been a Member of Parliament for about four years. And he was a very breezy, genial man, somebody who had a different idea every day of the week. And eventually he got a job. Before he was elected to Parliament, he got a job as an honorary attaché in the British Embassy in Constantinople. And that gave him the opportunity to keep on travelling. François-Georges Picot was a very different man. He was much more serious. He was a rather humorless man, the British thought. And he had also served in the region. He had been France's consul to Beirut just before the First World War broke out. And in fact, the outbreak of war forced him back to, to Paris. 
And François-Georges Picot himself joined the French Foreign Office, the Quai d'Orsay, in 1898. And this is a really crucial part of his biography because that, of course, was the year of Fashoda, uh, the Fashoda incident, when Britain and France nearly went to rule to war over the ownership of the upper river Nile. And we know it it was something that really registered with him. He constantly referred to the incident and it left him with a, um, uh, it, it made him realize that in the future, France needed to be much tougher when it was dealing with the British government. So these two men couldn't be more different. What happened when uh, Sykes and Pico met for the very first time? So they met for the first time in December 1915, and the circumstances of that meeting were quite awkward. Georges Picot had come to London a couple of months earlier. He'd set himself the job of negotiating an agreement with the British government over the future of the Middle East. And the early meetings he had with the British had resulted in a complete deadlock. France wanted so much, Britain wanted so much, and the two sides simply couldn't agree. And Mark Sykes then was brought in by the British cabinet to try and find a way through the impasse. And he came up with the idea of a very simple straight line division of the Middle East between France and Britain. And if you read the minutes of the meeting that, that Sykes went to, he described it like this. He said, I'd like to draw a line from the E of Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. And the British minister sitting on the round the table opposite him loved this idea and loved the simplicity of it. And they uh, frankly wanted to delegate the problem to somebody else. So they deputed Sykes to go and meet Georges Picot. And indeed, ever since the sykes picot agreement is seen by many as the source of all evil, is that a cliché or is there actually some uh, truth to it? The sykes picot agreement is responsible for one very important issue, and that is the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because the Sykes-Picot agreement didn't resolve the question of Palestine. Neither of them could agree that the other one could have it. And so they resolved at the time when they did the deal that it should have an international administration, but neither of them liked that as a concept. And in the Balfour Declaration in 1917, they offered the Jews a national home. And of course, that became the mandate of Palestine after the war. And large number of Jews moved there, particularly once Hitler came to power in, in Germany. And that set the scene for the, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Well, it's a century after Sykes-Picot, but you don't seem to be very optimistic about the next century, do you? I'm not, unless those countries can develop more stable forms of government. The, 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 bigger, the best antidote to these problems would be if each of these countries uh, could produce governments that are more robust, that reflect the desires of their people, that deliver economic growth for them. And so far, all of them have failed to do that. Now, that is partly because they have been subject to foreign interference. So a country like Syria did try to hold elections in the 1940s, but those elections were consistently rigged and interfered with by foreign foreign powers, including America, including Britain and, and France. Western powers were constantly trying to influence the outcome. Well, that doesn't sound very hopeful, unfortunately. Uh, anyhow, uh, if you would like to understand today's conflict, you should really start reading uh, the fascinating book, A Line in the Sand. Thank you very much for being with us, James Barr. And you can find the entire interview with the author in a separate podcast on our website, sofrench.news slash interview. The relation between France and Britain was difficult a century ago, but more trouble may be ahead. In less than a month, the UK will vote if they should stay or leave the European Union. In case of a Brexit, the two countries will drift apart. So what's your bet? Will Britain be in or out? Listen to a report by Modico. Six weeks from the vote on Brexit, the polls are still evenly split between the leave and remain. In the past, when it comes to political matters, the polls have been wrong most of the time. The Scottish referendum, they got it wrong. The general election, they got it wrong too. 
So, to cheer himself up, Tony, a Brit who's been living in Paris for eight years, has a pretty unusual criteria to look at the predictions on Brexit. Tony goes on the internet to look at the betting odds because he thinks they are much more reliable than Paul's. And apparently, the bets are giving the Remain vote as a clear favourite. Here is how it works. Imagine you're putting a £10 bet for Brexit. And if Brexit happens, the bookmaker will give you back your £10 and he'll give you another £25 on top of it. If you bet for leave and we remain in the EU, the bookmaker will give you back your £10 and give you maybe two or three pounds on top of that. Which means that for the bookmaker, it's much more likely that we're going to stay in Europe than leave it. They make that calculation on other people's bets. So most people who are using their money to express what they think is going to happen, not what they want to happen, but most people who are betting their money are betting that we're going to remain in the EU, and I think that's a very good indicator. So according to Tony, Britain is more likely to remain in the EU. But if the bookmakers are wrong, Tony already knows the choice he will have to make. I will definitely be applying for French citizenship if that happens, because I want to be a citizen of a European country. I believe in the European project and I want to be part of it. I am very proud to be British, uh, but I believe firmly that Britain's place is in a Europe where people pull together and don't descend into the kind of tribalism that for centuries and centuries and centuries started wars. That was Mordecai with the first of our short series on Brexit. The next couple of weeks we will broadcast reports and interviews on this topic and you will find all the reports on our website softfrench.news slash Brexit. And we're now leaving politics for some entertainment. The expectations are building up here in France for the kickoff of the Euro 2016 football tournament. The first game is in less than two weeks, when host country France will meet Romania. There's been a lot of talking about security surrounding the event, of course, and to be honest, it doesn't really sound like it's quite a done deal yet. A national football game, La Coupe de France, the National Cup, was marred by security issues just last week, and the authorities promised to speed up and rethink the preparations. However, hoping that all of that will be sorted out, there is, of course, uh, the joyful side of to course. this event. And we have earlier played uh, the French national team's song for the tournament. Now, French superstar DJ David Guetta has released the official UEFA song for Euro 2016. And uh, this is what it sounds like. This one's for you. Even got a Swedish connection. <laughs> Swedish star Sara Larsson performs the song. And uh, you also even hear fans on that title, actually. David Guetta last year invited fans to contribute to the song. But there is no success without a scandal. Now, David Guetta is accused of having copied his song. It apparently sounds very much like uh, the mega hit Lean On. All we need is some Judge for yourself, and copy or not, David Guetta will give a free concert at the opening of the so-called Fan Zone at the Champ de Mars, that's almost under the Eiffel Tower here in Paris, and that concert takes place on June the 9th, that's uh, one day before the month-long football tournament will start. And before we leave you, we have some good news about François Hollande. What? <laughs> yes, seriously. It's unbelievable, Sarah. But it's true. François Hollande has been elected the World Statesman of the Year. And this was an election by the Appeal of Conscience Foundation based in New York City. It's actually a rather obscure, uh, more or less religious foundation. And it also gave the prize in 2008 to the then president Nicolas Sarkozy. And in 2013, the winner was the Indonesian president Yudhoyono, and he, however, persecuted minority groups and is even suspected of ordering genocide in West Papua. So, according to human rights activists, the Appeal of Conscious Foundation is little more than a vehicle for publicity seeking and influence peddling. But, you know, it's an award for Hollande anyway, and in these difficult times, uh, well, maybe it's a reason for a party. 
Actually, yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> Why not? And actually, today, as we're recording this episode, uh, there is a party going on. And unless you live here, you are not invited. Really? <laughs> it's La Fête des Voisins, uh, Neighbors Day here in France. Uh, this annual tradition was uh, created in 1999. And the idea is to spend a delightful moment with your neighbors. And, um, well, that could be as having share a... Aperitif, which is a sort of like a French national sport, or even a, a full buffet a dinner uh, together with your closest neighbors. A dinner with people you don't really like? That doesn't really sound like a party to me. Well, and the question is if you really like them that much also, because uh, the French are actually not that much friends with their neighbors. According to some studies, one in, th one in three consider that their relationship to their neighbors is bad. And 84% of the French have already had issues with their neighbors. Well, it sounds like a lovely party, but I think I'll uh, pass. Are you invited? <laughs> no, no. Nobody ever invites me. I wonder why that is. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of So French. Follow us on Twitter at So French News. And if you have any questions or suggestions, just send us an email. Our address is SoFrench at SoFrench.news. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or in SoundCloud. And to share So French with your friends. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. We hope you will join us then. And until then, thank you for listening. Au revoir. <laughs>